Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Ham Nation is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Ham Nation is brought to you by LegalZoom. Visit LegalZoom.com to save on your legal needs and gain access to a network of legal plan attorneys for guidance. LegalZoom is not a law firm but provides self-help services at your specific direction. Visit LegalZoom.com and use offer code HAMNATION to receive $10 off at checkout. By ICOM. For more information, visit ICOMAmerica.com slash HAMNATION. And by DX Engineering. DX Engineering offers practically everything you need to outfit your shack, plus the fastest shipping in the industry. In-stock items ship the same day, Monday through Friday, until 10 p.m. Eastern. For more information, visit dxengineering.com slash hamnation. This is Ham Nation, episode number 164, September 10th, 2014. We talk about connectors, mixers, and Route 66. Hello, everybody. It's K9EID, Bob Heil, uh, this week known as W6R, or one of those. (laughs) We're coming to you from Springfield, Missouri tonight, and we got a great show. I mean, it's really great tonight. There's so much here. And I'm sure we're probably going to run over, but I want you to uh, pay attention. We're going to do all kinds of stuff. George has got his smoke and solder cooking down the line. Uh, Don's going to smoke a pipe and uh, give us some news line. (laughs) And we're going to talk about all kinds of stuff, all kinds of stuff. (laughs) And uh, the best thing that's going to happen is uh, uh, we're going to talk about Route 66. We're going to build a mixer. Yes, we're going to build a mixer. And uh, uh, George... Nice to have you back. How are you? You okay? Well, yeah, I'm good. It's it's good to be back. I had, uh, well, I would say I had fun. I was actually working when I was in North Carolina, but I did operate some HF from the hotel room, and we're going to talk a little bit about that tonight. No wires. Yeah, here. we're going to have. Yeah, going to do some remoting. All right, so we're going to come back to that. And uh, Dale's got some great videos. But first of all, we're headed to California, and we're going to hear all about what's going on and some shots from Gordo, WB6NOA. Gordon, how are you, buddy? I am just fine, and we have survived at least one storm. But tomorrow, HF is going to be question mark because we have an extreme solar storm ready to bombard our ionosphere tomorrow afternoon. So if you're on HF and conditions get rough, uh, don't blame it on your radio or antenna or coax, but rather it's probably the solar storm. Now last week, Bob, uh, they had a storm in Las Vegas, not solar, but flooding. And I'm happy to report that the Clark County ARAS and RACES group serving Las Vegas and the counties north of Las Vegas swung into action and ham radio operators were there at both locations to make things happen for comms. Now, this coming Saturday, Santa Fe Trails, you and George will be on Skype at their convention. And this Saturday and Sunday is also the American Radio Relay League's Southwestern Division convention out here near San Diego. Uh, and that is operated by sandark.org. And uh, this Sunday in uh, southern New Jersey, Lancaster County Amateur Radio Club having its get together. Now, week after next, I'll see those of you taking the Instructor Academy course in Peoria. That's on the 19th. And then the Peoria Superfest on the 20th and 21st. Uh, West Chester Amateur Radio Association. They'll have a signal as powerful as Voice of America because that's where they'll be transmitting from the old decommissioned VOA site. Wow, on the 20th. And London, Ontario uh, will be on the air on the 21st Sunday at the uh, Hellenink Community Center. Route 66, we'll hear more about that. And, of course, September 28th, Sunday, last man standing, and you're going to hear more about that. But um, George operated from his hotel room uh, remote 
Let's talk about non-remote using good old coax cable. So Victor, who is our engineer in charge of board man, if you'll go ahead and roll the Gordo short shots on the importance of coax. Coax cable center conductor surrounded by an insulation, surrounded by an outside braid, surrounded by the outside jacket. There's a piece of coax so you know what we're talking about. Lots of different coax connectors, the BNC. Not many handhelds these days are using those. The PL259, the N connector, and uh, there's the SMA, and there's two kinds of those. Forget about the right one. That is for cable television. That's the F connector. We won't be using that on ham. So a few radios these days use the BNC. Those radios were troubled by the circuit board getting broken if you dropped your handheld off of the antenna. Uh, of course, your HF radios use this, the common PL259, and a real ham has one that is gold-plated. It doesn't make a bit of difference, I don't think, on the air, but it's always nice to show off your gold-plated PL. We use end connectors on UHF uh, work and higher, and uh, anytime you have exotic uh, systems like uh, these filters, we normally plumb them with the end connector in that it's waterproof and it's exactly 50 ohms. And uh, there's the SMA, two kinds, male and female. That's the male type. But if you have one of those Chinese handhelds, guess what? The handheld has the male. You're going to need a reverse SMA that is female to make that play. So if you got a Chinese handheld that takes this kind of an antenna, something to think about. That won't work with a regular made in Japan or Taiwan transceiver. Now, there's big coax, uh, sometimes called RG8, LMR400. It's big, it's heavy, and it takes the PL259. That's the big stuff. Uh, we use the big stuff anytime we have a run of any length uh, going up to a beam antenna. And whenever possible, use the big stuff because the ham is judged by the quality of his coax. You don't want to run a little tiny spaghetti up to a big antenna system. Now, if you're developing a, a small antenna system down on HF, the Mini 8, sometimes called RG8X, is perfectly acceptable. Just make sure that if you're using it for uh, feeding a mag mount, that uh, you put the mag mount in the center of the roof. This mag mount is interesting. It's base loading on HF. That gets pretty warm on HF. And anytime you get a uh, antenna coil getting warm, you're losing some of the energy and the heat. Here we are is a uh, matching network that we've developed uh, using the RG8X. It's good quality RG8X, uh, almost 95% uh, shield. And notice I've got coax seal up there at the top. And that coax seal makes sure that uh, we don't have uh, anything that's going to get moisture in it. And Victor, if you'll go to the next uh, slide, please. And uh, in marine applications, they use a called non-contaminating jacket, which means that this jacket in the marine side won't break down with ultraviolet uh, rays uh, beating on it. So big coax, try and use that whenever possible. Smaller coax for mobile runs or very short runs. And again, coax center conductor surrounded by, in this case, a uh, looks like a PVC uh, 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 insulation, and then the outside braid, and then the black part is called the jacket. And um, for small mobile runs, uh, a good quality piece of coax is what you need to be able to get the coax in through the trunk. Can't run RG8U there. And uh, I always put a little bit of foam on it to make sure I'm not going to tweak that connection. Because on a mobile mount, if you lose the outside braid, right there at the connector, you're going to have a very high SWR on your mobile antenna system. And many mobile antennas start off with a little teeny coax called RG174, and here we see it reduced down to RG8X. Now, we'll take another look at uh, some, uh, and next uh, shot, uh, Victor, please, we'll take a look at uh, a big hunk of coax. This is called Hardline, and notice that it's got a hole in the center. That's because we got to save on the use of copper and due to skin effect, the RF at uh, UHF and higher frequencies travels on the outside of that inner conductor. And sometimes they'll backfill that whole insulation. And next slide, 
uh, with a uh, nitrogen, dry nitrogen, to make sure moisture doesn't get into it. In fact, the skin effect uh, up on uh, 10,000 megahertz, we don't even use coax. We use what we call as a uh, waveguide. There's a hunk of waveguide for uh, when we're doing. Next slide, um, uh, please, uh, Victor. So that uh, black is flexible waveguide. Almost looks like coax, but it is not. It is a uh, plain old uh, waveguide. And next shot, uh, Victor. Now, you can buy cheap coax that we see on the left. That's about 75% uh, exposed copper braid or sort of cheap coax, that's the middle one, or quality coax, and I recommend get it from DX Engineering because all they carry is quality. That's the stuff on the right. Notice that the right is silver tinned, so if there's any moisture that gets in there, it's not going to immediately eat out the coax cable outside uh, braid. Next slide. And uh, if we take a look at that lousy coax, 75% braid, you could get by on HF, but up on V and UHF, you're going to lose a, a good portion of your signal. It's just going to leak out. Next one. There's a little better, but again, it's exposed copper, even though you've got the jacket on it. And you're going to lose a lot just leaking out from that. And they don't tell you on the outside jacket, usually on the big coax, percentage of braid. You've got to ask that question and demand. Let's go to the next one, uh, Victor. Demand 100% braid. And not only is this 100% braid, guess what's underneath that uh, silver uh, uh, braid? But you see it, it is oil. So that's the very best, and that is a non-contaminating jacket that you see that we've stripped away, and we had a hard time doing that. And we've got the weave, and then we have the aluminum foil. This coax is wonderful for VHF, UHF, and it would be great on HF as well, the big coax. And you can see that it's actually got a spacer that keeps the center conductor properly spaced and held apart. Very important, though, if you go to solder this, which you're going to need to do to put on that PL259, make absolutely sure not a little bit of that tin covering the insulation shorts out to the center conductor. That can sometimes uh, happen. Oh, look at that. That is ugly coax. That jacket was not non-contaminating. Sunlight broke it loose, moisture got into it. That connection is POW. Always check out your coax connection. Here's a good one. Chip Margelli put this one together. That's a stub he's got on the left side, and he's got it well sealed on the right-hand side with tape. And if you're going to be putting any type of chokes on your coax, put them on before uh, you need to put on the PL259 if they don't unsnap, uh, such as this one here. And these are good toroidal inductors that will help keep the RF creeping down uh, the coax cable. And uh, you can buy these for a couple of bucks a piece at uh, ham uh, fests or um, at the radio stores for a little bit more. And you can't have enough of them. And anytime we have uh, inside repeater connections, we usually plumb them with uh, the large coax and end connectors. Black tape. Oh, that's a great connection, huh? Let's take the tape apart. And see this great outside connection on there. Ooh, that is ugly. Moisture gets in there and your coax is now going to soak up energy. And we pull that tape back a little further on the antenna itself. The next one, uh, Victor. And when we do that, it is double ugly. In fact, we couldn't even get the connector off. It was totally waterlogged. So any exposed coax connectors make sure that they are absolutely uh, well sealed. That's called coax seal. Next one, Victor. Uh, and no gizmos in between. This is went to a little SWR analyzer, uh, not a name brand one, but one that came in from overseas for $12. And what does that tell you? What a piece of junk. Do not put anything in the middle of your coax, such as this uh, little uh, device here. Next one. And there's a good... Uh, PL259, all soldered up. Some are crimp, and crimp are okay. Next one. And you can look at it, and you really can't tell for sure that it's a great uh, connector, so it's always good to meter them out. Next one. And as we meter them out, uh, this one's good, but here's how you tell. You tell your buddy, pull back that outside barrel, the left-hand side. Back it off, unscrew it, and let me look at where you have soldered to the outside braid. And this is what tells a good connector 
and a good connection job and a good solder job versus one that uh, is either cold soldered or sometimes not even soldered at all. Now, on the larger coax, we have different ways of doing it, and we'll talk about that in the future. Yes, you can close a door on coax. Normally, it doesn't kill the coax. Uh, yes, you can put uh, the big heavy coax out for field day, but you leave a loop like that early in the morning. Guess what you're going to find? Yep, that's me after uh, taking a nosedive on the coax. So uh, be safe with your coax runs. No, you can't tell the amount of loss on a piece of coax with just an SWR meter, but you could put a load on it and check for how much power you're getting at the far end. That is one way to go. I just like to use good coax, and then I don't have to lug this all the way up to the roof to terminate it and see how much power I'm really getting out. Of course, any coax, make sure that you've got it well covered. Coax seal comes from Reynoldsburg, Ohio, and uh, the uh, shortwave group there uh, do a nice job of providing coax seal. Universal Radios, who has that? There's a nice coax seal um, uh, attachment to a beam antenna. Oh, very, very nice. I don't think we'll have any moisture getting into that uh, coax connector. So finally, uh, make sure that you've got good coax. Go to the next shot, uh, Victor. And uh, make sure that beside the coax here, you got some tape on there as well. And make sure that none of that water is going to stand on your connection. Next one, Victor. And again, uh, we'll be talking more about how we each have our own technique of soldering the big cable to a PL-259. More about that later. But more important than that are, hey, let's go to the next slide, are our important three. That's John Amadeo, Julian Frost, and that, of course, is Ray Novak, and we're going to be hearing them. You can come back to me now, live and on the air in just a couple more weeks at Last Man Standing. So watch your coax connections. Get only good coax, and I get mine from DX Engineering. You'll be happy that you did the same thing and go for the big stuff whenever you can. Bob, back to you. Well, Gordo, that was great. I mean, really great. And uh, we need more of uh, more of this kind of information because I know there's a lot of a lot of guys and gals that learn from that kind of thing. But uh, we'll have to bring Tim Duffy in some night and he can explain how he puts a solder uh, to a coax connector. <laughs> well, I have on my hat. Second time in oh, years, I don't wear caps, but it's a very special week. It's Route 66 on the air, and I hope that you are joining in on all this. It's really cool. Uh, go to W6R. That's the website or the uh, QRZ page for the Springfield Club, which is one of 21 clubs that are involved in this. And... Uh, you can le read a little bit aloud about all of it. The host club is w6jbt.org. Uh, we have some sh some pictures and some things we want to show you. So let's uh, go rush through them and see what's happening. This is at the historic Route 66 Park here in Springfield. And the uh, Southwest Missouri uh, Amateur Radio Club set up there. And we operated Friday and Saturday there. And it was really a fun time. And uh, uh, it, there again, we're, we're, we're out to get the public to know what amateur radio does. So uh, Route 66 was just an, another excuse for, for us to be there. And uh, use all kinds of rig. This is a, a good old TS-50. Uh, Steve uses this thing uh, everywhere. It's been all over. And it just continues to pump out signals. There he is with a new MFJ QRP rig. He was on 20 meters uh, QRP. He's on all week. We, I worked a bunch of QRP stations this past few nights, and uh, it's so much fun uh, to see these QRP guys get in and fight the big pileups and win. <laughs> <laughs> There's Sean. He's uh, he's really one of the geniuses in the club. If we have a problem, he's the guy. <laughs> he he is. You know, everybody has a guy. There's our guy right there. He's uh, he's wonderful. Very tactical. And because of all this, and this is why we do it, is to get the media attention. This is NBC KY3, 
and the radio stations came out, the newspaper, and so on. And, and that's what it's all about, everybody. When you set these things up for field day and, and special events, send out press releases and let people know why we are there and get a good plug in locally for your club. That's important. And there were some of the guys and gals that uh, make it all happen here in Springfield. And these, uh, you know, all kinds of things up there uh, uh, as far as our uh, uh, our QSL cards, uh, the certificates, there's decals, and uh, all of the things that you, uh, that you associate with it. Here, I'll show you a few of those live. Come back to me here, Victor. Uh, these are a couple of cards that... Uh, that were out uh, a few years ago for some of the guys. That was uh, Albuquerque. And uh, these are cards that uh, that really make it fun. They're decals and, of course, all of their certificates to work the stations. This will be the card for Springfield. And uh, we're very excited about all of this, and I want you to be too. Uh, and uh, it, it's really fun to work the pileups. But I want you to hear one of the pileups. Let's see if we can hear this little guy. And here you're we go. enjoying the uh, special event. This is W6R. Is that okay, uh, Victor? Oh, wow. Okay, Don, very good. AE5DW, uh, this is W6R. So nice to hear you, and uh, we're having a lot of fun, and I'm, I'm hoping you're working some of the other stations. And uh, we'll talk to you Wednesday night, I bet you. Yeah, I bet you will. Yeah, I, I was tuning around, and I heard Amanda, and I thought, oh, I didn't get Amanda in my log. Well, there's proof of who broke the pile up. <laughs> and who broke the pile up? Don. And I, I couldn't believe it, but there was proof. Okay. And, uh, Thanks so much, uh, uh, Gordo. We call him in tailenders. Is that what you have? What you call him? A tailender? Yeah, yeah. Is that what he was? That's yeah, a tailender. <laughs> it's all. It's all. Yeah. Yeah, all sphere won- and love and DX. All sphere and love and DX. Ah. <laughs> that's right. You got there, buddy. And you know what? You're going to get the card. And that's isn't that what it's all about? Of course it is. Yes, it is. <laughs> Yes, it is. <laughs> oh, that's golly. Not, that's not, that's it's not too the only much card fun. I'm going to get. Look at this. Yeah, that's not the only you. card I'm going to get. I've got, I've got uh, 17 of the 21 so far. Whoa. Oh, congratulations. Yeah. That's great. Working on them. Working well, on them. I want all of you to get involved. And you think, wow, i got to have all this. Po-. No, you don't. I worked a whole, a whole bunch of QRP stations and mobiles. There were quite a few mobiles, uh, uh, 16, uh, uh, 16 or 18, I think I had the count of mobiles in this thing. Had a bunch of truckers. And oh, we're, we're just we're thrilled to death to be a part of that this year. So check it out. And um, if you go to W6R, you'll have all the frequencies of where we start out. And uh, but tune around because there's 21 of them and they don't can't all be on the same frequency. But you'll find out where they are. So thanks very much for uh, checking in and uh, making it so much fun this week. Well, we're going to go back down to Don because Don's got some news. I think about some legal things that we might have to pay attention to. I, I do, as a matter of fact. And before we get into that, you're right. It doesn't take. It's it's more technique and, and operator skill than anything. It's cranking all the highs up. Uh, and making sure that you can bust through it on 100 watts on an off-center fed 80-meter dipole from uh, from uh, from radio waves, the DX80. That's 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 what I use. So and it works. All right, let's talk about legal zoom. Now, when you're planning for your future, you got to do financial planning. You get insurance, but to get real peace of mind, you got to make sure that your family and your finances are legally protected. So the best place to turn for help there is LegalZoom.com. For over 13 years, they've been helping Americans just like you and me get personalized wills, powers of attorney, and living trusts. And LegalZoom also helps file LLCs, S corporations, and a whole lot more to protect you against personal liability. That's what it's all about. The company was started by some of the best legal minds in the country. 
They make it painless for you to go get the legal protection you need. If you've got questions, you can always reach out to someone at LegalZoom. They will be there and talk you through the process, and it's easy. Protect your family. Protect your future at LegalZoom.com. You need to visit LegalZoom.com and use offer code HAMNATION to get $10 off a checkout. Now, you you can get legal help through independent attorneys and self-help services at your direction, but LegalZoom is not a law firm. LegalZoom, thank you so much for your support of Ham Nation. It is probably the, the most important thing you will ever do is to uh, protect yourself and your family. And now we're going to go uh, a couple of hours to my north and do something else uh, a little bit important, and that is crank up the soldering iron with George. George, my friend, go ahead. Hi, Don. I actually did crank up the soldering iron last week. However, it was at a couple of radio stations and I wasn't able to run a camera and solder at the same time. But uh, I did do a little amateur radio related stuff at the hotel room. And I just wanted to show you that, you know, I've got the IC7700 from ICOM over here. And that latest firmware really um, upped the game a little bit on what that rig can do. All I had to do basically was plug a, a cable from the CAT5 jack on the rear of the radio into my internet router, set the IP addresses in the rig, and I was ready to run remote. I did add one thing to it, and we'll see that in here too, but let's just take a look at that. Hey, John. Oh, yeah. W5 JDX, just uh, checking in here remote again, only 200 watts. I was just going to Try to make a contact here. You want to be on Ham Nation next week? Yeah, I want to be on Ham Nation. I'm going to do that. All you got to do is talk to me because I'm recording it and we'll use it as a segment next week. Yeah, he doesn't try to do the action. He will do the for Ham Nation viewers only. For Ham Nation viewers only. All right. Got that. Well, I tried checking in on the nets tonight. Uh, my problem is the antenna I left connected was an 80 meter loop and I've got a manual tuner in line and it's tuned for 75 meters but somehow I managed to make a contact on the 20 meter net. I couldn't do the 40 meter net but I figure I could talk here and of course uh, Cheryl didn't have the net tonight but hey I found you and that's just as good. And you're about to go over there and no problem here. Well, good deal. Yeah, you're very strong here on me. Well, I just wanted to give it a shout here and uh, and try it out and just prove that I actually was doing some ham radio from the hotel room. Oh, that's very cool. And also, this makes me almost the same as you get. I don't think so. I don't think so. Don't even go there. Uh, it's kind of over here in Louisville, too. Okay. I think we got Phil in there, and I heard JD in there, too, and both of you are very strong here. Well, you'll get to be on the show, too, then. Okay, I'll just sign a release form. Uh, yeah, release form. Yes, you, you can use a personal check for that, and uh, I'll, I'll email you the amount, and then you can just sign it. I'm going to send you a roll of toilet paper. Oh, that could happen. Okay. George, I use the double fly. The, the double ply. Well, they only have the single ply here in the hotel room, and it's kind of like sandpaper. Yeah, it was a good show. It really was, and I want one of those vans. It really would be. Appreciate y'all doing this, and uh, we'll hear you on Ham Nation next week. Okay, George, I'll pleasure you. Take care. Seven three guys, W five JDX, and I'm using a high USB Q here to connect my PR twenty two into the computer. Oh, and by the way, it's the uh, ICOM RSBA one software running along with the remote utility that it comes with to do the connecting. What you do is first you connect to a server, which is the radio itself, and then you go to a radio list and select a particular radio. And that's because this software is written for a lot of different ICOM models. This is probably one of the few that doesn't need a computer at the other end. 
the IC7700 now, uh, thanks to the version 2 firmware, just connects straight into the internet itself. So it, it's been working great here. I've uh, really enjoyed listening to my buddies on HF while I'm traveling and it's a lot of fun. I just need to work out that antenna situation so that I can swap antennas. This year I've done more traveling than usual, so I've missed being on the radio. And when I first did this firmware upgrade, I really wanted that feature. I wanted to be able to remotely access my rig, but I was a little scared to do it because of lightning. You know, it's not a good idea to go off and leave your rig connected in the south during the summertime. Well, I came up with a solution for that, and I'll be showing that in the next Amateur Logic TV, and I'll probably be showing a little bit of the making of it here on Ham Nation as well because it's going to take a little while to show everything that's involved with it. Simple project and I want to give you enough detail that you can follow along at home and build your own if you want to. So there you go. No uh, actual solder on the show this week, although I did use some on that project there and that's just a prototype. I'm going to be taking that a little further. You can see the first stages of it, though, the prototyping at uh, Amateur Logic uh, Episode 70 just released today. I'll be starting on that project, and Tommy's going to be experimenting with the U uh, MFJ Ultrasound Noise Locator. And our buddy Peter Down Under participated in the 2014 DATV QSO party. And I got to say that a digital amateur television really looks great. It's. Uh, Oh, it, it's several steps above what we were able to do with analog. Looks great. So that's going to be on Amateur Logic. And, you know, that antenna switch project there is pretty simple to do. It just used an Arduino and a servo and an antenna switch, basically, with a few other components. I'm going to be um, detailing that out where you can build one yourself. And I'm going to have a little bit of each part of that on both shows. Not sure. Uh, which is which yet, but we'll be doing some of it on Ham Nation. And it's going to be a fun little project. And speaking of projects, you know, a month ago, I built this little Humanolite kit. You know, it runs off of uh, a dead 1.5-volt AA battery. And we ran it here for four weeks solid, and it still had a little light left in it. And when I left for my trip, it was... Uh, it had been on for four weeks and six days. I could barely tell it was on if I got in the dark. And I just left it on. And when I got back home this past Saturday, uh, it, it was dead. I didn't see anything on it, so I just turned it off. Well, if I turn it on now, there's still a little bit of light in there. It's not much, but a little bit. And I measured the battery voltage. It's at uh, 0.8 volts now. So that was pretty amazing to get that kind of life out of a single cell. Uh, let's do our contest now. You know, a couple of weeks ago when I was on, I asked the question, which of the following devices can be used for impedance matching at radio frequencies? A, a transformer. B, a Pi network. C, a length of transmission line. Or D, all of these choices are correct. Well, we got an answer from that from Bruce, N1EBQ, and he said it's D. All of the above are correct. So congratulations, Bruce. You're going to win this Chameleon CHA MCOM2 antenna. It's rated from 1.8 to 54 megahertz, and it's just got 60 feet of wire here on it. So we'll be shipping it out to you, and you can let us know how it works for you. For next week, we're going to give away something else here. This is going to be a high current voltage regulator, and it was donated by our friend Gary at www.n8wtt.com. The reason you would use one of these things is you QRP guys, you know, you're running off battery most of the time, and your battery voltage is pretty important for proper operation of the rig. Well, this will take anywhere between 8 and 16 volts DC input and give you 13.8 volts DC out. So if your battery starts getting weak, this will actually increase the voltage and let you get a little more usage out of it. It's got a blade-type fuse input. It's 15 amps maximum output, an LED indicator, and it's very lightweight. So if you'd like to win that, then answer this for me. And I'll show you what I'm talking about here. A servo. 
you know, the little motor that I'm using on the Arduino there, how does it know what position it's in? If you think you know the answer to that, then send me an email to hamnationcontest at gmail.com, and you could be next week's lucky winner. And right now, I guess we ought to get a word from ICOM. Mark your calendars, D-Star fans. The D-Star QSO party is this month, and you're invited. Connect with the world via D-Star repeaters from Friday, September 19th through Sunday, September 21st. Contact ham radio operators around the world using D-Star. D-Star has helped amateur radio grow. It's an exciting technology that has introduced new people to the hobby. And it's been a great protocol for MCOM, too. Join the D-Star QSO party and communicate through D-Star repeaters. The more QSOs you make, the more chances you have to win. Multiply your chances of collecting points when you contact a set number of foreign countries. Earn up to one bonus point when you send GPS information indicating communication distance via the D-Star radio. Submit an approved log to be eligible for the prize drawing. Visit ICOM America's website for complete contest rules, log reporting, and more. The D-Star QSO party winners will receive a brand new ID-51A ICOM 50th Anniversary Limited Edition radio. Ten lucky winners will be randomly selected. Winners can only receive one prize and cannot choose the radio color. Only 5,000 ID-51A units are available worldwide. The radio is available in five colors. Blue, green, red, white, and black. Special edition radio features include... Faster data transfer on DV mode, RS-MS1A Android app compatibility, additional D-plus reflector link commands, and other enhanced digital features. Make sure you visit icomamerica.com slash amateur for more information on the 2014 D-Star QSO party and the 50th anniversary limited edition ID-51A. And you can tune in and enter to win after each episode of Ham Nation. Go to icomamerica.com slash ham nation and register for some great swag prizes from the Icom Swag Store. They've got hats, T-shirts, and a variety of stuff in there. And you could possibly win just by going and registering. Now do that after each episode of Ham Nation. And you'll also be entered in the grand prize drawing where they give away a radio each month. And for September, the grand prize is going to be the ICOM ID31A. That's a submersible construction UHF handheld with D-Star, built-in GPS, micro SD card slot, automatic repeater list up, and a lot more. So go after the show this evening to icomamerica.com slash hamnation and register to win. And we've got another ICOM radio we're giving away, and that's this ID7100 right behind me here. It's the all-mode, all-band, mobile transceiver with D-Star. Uh, we're also giving away a little Tar Heel 2 antenna with that, an MFJ antenna tuner, and a Comet dual-band, and all the mounts that you'd need to make a complete HF station. If you're interested in that, then go over to AmateurLogic.com and register for this great ICOM giveaway here. And we appreciate them doing that for us as well. And I think we've got Dale standing by with some more videos for us. Dale? Thanks, George. It's great football weather here in South Central Kansas. Great uh, weekend time we had putting up a 160-meter off-center-fed dipole also. Looking forward to that this winter. And we've got lots of photos and a great video from the WW1 USA operation up in Kansas City. Right now, let's jump into Show Me Your Shack. This month, photos of ham shacks and ham fests. Our cover shot is of a mobile field day. It comes from John, W5GFI, and the Northeast Oklahoma Radio Amateurs Club. Shots are in the order they were received. Here's the shack of Adam, K5OCS. Dave, K3DCW, runs a K3P3 combo. His computer's a Mac Mini Quad I7 under the desk. Dave runs the popular website, MacHamRadio.com. Thomas Wayne, WB8N, sent us two shots from the Fair Winds Alternative Green Energy Special Event in early August. The 500-kilowatt turbine seen through the window supplied the power. The Cuyahoga Amateur Radio Society operators ran the station. 
40 meter post show net regular Kevin KC7 FPF sent us this shot of his summer project, the rebuild of the console in his truck. The International Lighthouse and Lightship Weekend was a big event during August. Mike VE3MIC sent us in this shot of one of the active lighthouses. Here's the shack of Pete W2NJU in New Jersey. He has a Kenwood 2000, a Heil HM12 microphone, and a set of Heil ProSet 3 headphones. Here's Pete. Jim at W4WW sent several shots of his shack. Here's his Flex 3000 with Palstar tuner and his AL811H amplifier. For antennas, Jim uses a 43-foot vertical and 32 radials. He also has a Chris Craft AR6 for 6 meters and a W5GI mystery wire antenna. Here's the shack of Clayton, W4KVW. He just added the ICOM PW1. He also has an ICOM 756 Pro and an ICOM 746 Pro, as well as an ICOM 2820H. Here's a late night shot with the eerie glow of the multicolored LEDs at K0HYD. Ray, WA3PRR in Brady's Bend, Pennsylvania, uses an IC7200 and two older Heathkit rigs. He has an HW8 and an HW101. He also uses the W5GI mystery antenna dipole, as well as a random wire. And he has a Gap Titan DX. He uses FL Digi software with his MacBook Pro. He operates mainly CW and has keys on the wall and straight keys on the shelf and a whole bunch of bugs on another shelf. Now let's visit the ham shack of last man standing. John Amadeo, NN7JA, the producer of Last Man Standing, sent these photos of the setup at CBS Studio 9. That studio was the home of Seinfeld for nine years. It's now the home of Last Man Standing. And here's Tim Allen, also known as Mike Baxter, showing his grandson his amateur radio station last Thanksgiving. Here's the main rig at KA0XXT and some of the auxiliary equipment used at last band standing. And this is what John calls the wall of fame collected by the active hams that work there at last man standing. Uh, speaking of operating, the hams at last man standing will be hosting K6H, Hollywood celebrates ham radio. That'll happen on Sunday, September 28th, just a couple of weeks from now. They'll be operating HF, BHF, UHF, D-Star, IRLP, and Echolink. And join us on the video segment here in two weeks on the 24th for the premiere of a special video John produced to commemorate the K6H special event. We'll switch now from ham shacks to ham fest. Here's JD in zero IRS arriving at the Joplin, Missouri ham fest. He's ready to shoot another great video. Jim W5JCS sent us a number of photos from Joplin. Here the crowd waits for the doors to open. And inside, here's the huge flea market with equipment like this vintage Collins 32S transmitter displayed by Don. W5FFK. Our host, Bob, K9EID, was at Joplin. Here he visits with a few of his friends. And Jim also grabbed a selfie with Bob. On the same weekend, the Kansas State ARRL convention was underway in Salina, Kansas. Here, Midwest Vice Director and soon-to-be Director passes one of the door prizes to Rod, K0EQH. From ARRL headquarters, the field and regulatory correspondent Chuck Scalott, K0BOG, addresses a morning seminar. Justin Reed, NV8Q, was named the Kansas Amateur of the Year by Chairman Stan Kreitz, WA0CCW. And meanwhile, on the show floor, Honorary Vice President Bruce Fram, K0BJ, 
and assistant director Mike Albers, K0FJ, manned the ARRL booth with Kansas section manager Ron Cowan, KB0DTI. That's it. Ham shacks and ham fests on Show Me Your Shack. Make sure to send your shack photos to Ham Nation videos at TWIT.TV. And please try to keep the camera in landscape mode, if you will, and look for another edition around October 6th. Well, thanks to John Amadeo for the last man standing shack photos. This afternoon, John sent us the official 2014 K6H QSL card. And then don't forget, uh, in a couple of weeks, John will be back with a video presentation that features the K6H operation. There's the QSL card you could uh, get by working them. Well, this past weekend was a big day at the World War I Memorial up in Kansas City, Missouri. The Johnson County Amateur Radio Group activated WW1USA and JD in zero IRS was there for Ham Nation. I'm Herb, NZ0F. I'm co-coordinator with the Johnson County Radio Amateur Club uh, for this event of the WW1USA special event. We couldn't have picked a better time and a better uh, better place. This is this uh, event is commemorating the Battle of the Marne. Uh, at the beginning of World War I, the German troops were pretty much marching in uh, unimpeded uh, across Belgium and into, into northern France, and it wasn't until they got to the Marne River uh, that the Allies finally took a stand and were able to uh, push them back. And so uh, the Battle of the Marne, also called the Miracle of the Marne, uh, is what we're commemorating this weekend. Uh, and we will continue to do this for a while to commemorate other significant events in World War okay, Hi, I'm Jamie Charlton. I'm call sign AD0AB, and we're with the Johnson County Radio Amateurs Club of Johnson County, Kansas. And we're here today sort of commemorating and celebrating the um, uh, World War I anniversary, 100th anniversary. Uh, the Behind me is the World War I uh, Museum, but alongside me here in the item of interest is the World War One amateur radio station. We have uh, CW, or code, as you can hear in the background, beeping. We also have a phone station operating, and phone is voice in the amateur lingo. So people here right now are working actually all over the world. We got here early this morning and set up temporary equipment, and now it uh, is paying off. We've made a number of contacts, both in voice and code. And just to show that code is not quite dead, there's a number of us operating it. So uh, we're having a good time out here and at the same time recognizing uh, the value that World War I added to history and kind of spreading, you know, the knowledge of it around, around the world right now. And these contacts are all over the world. This is not a local operation by any means. So anyway, that's pretty much what's going on here at the moment. This is AD0AB saying 73, and good luck. J.D., thanks for that uh, super video and that great special event up in Kansas City. Next time, the K6H special event video and more. We'll shoot for another Show Me Your Shack around October 6th, or rather 8th. 
So don't forget to send your shack photos and your video links to Ham Nation videos at TWIT.TV. Remember, all videos presented here are available anytime for viewing at hamnationvideos.info. And still to come on Ham Nation, Bob shows you how to build an audio mixer, and Amanda has the latest from the chat room. But uh, first, let's check in with Don for the latest news from DX Engineering. Yeah, thanks, Donna. Before we get into that, Gordo mentioned... Um Coax, and this dovetails nicely with the DX Engineering commercial because they mentioned DX Engineering is a great place to get your coax. Here's a little pigtail. This is a 19-inch pigtail, and uh, I, I want to show you just how they seal the end of this pigtail up. It is amazing that it, there is glue inside that shrink wrap, and everything is completely and totally sealed. The same thing with this end of it. It is glued, and everything glue inside that uh, shrink tubing. And good stuff. This is indicative of the kind of stuff you're going to get at DX Engineering. Now, they have plenty of stuff, as we see here, to make your on-the-air experience better. But even though you may eat, sleep, and breathe ham radio, you, you can't operate 24-7. There are those rare moments when you got to put down the mic, step away from the key, and maybe take a little break. Doesn't mean you got to get away from ham radio, though. For instance, the K4UEED Expedition videos that you can get at DX Engineering make for a great club movie night or maybe rainy days when the ionosphere just isn't cooperating like the next day or two may be, sunspots and everything. They're also an excellent addition to uh, the library of operators who were lucky enough to work one of these DX ex uh, DX expeditions. Uh, prepared by Hall of Fame DX traveler and author Bob Alfin, K4UEE. Uh, the DVDs tell the real ham radio story. Some are funny, some are scary. They're all interesting, and they're all great. Now, each video uh, addresses a specific D expedition. The 2012 uh, HK0NA Malpilo Island, 2009's K5D Desicheo Island, and 2007's 3X5A Guinea West Africa, and more. There are uh, The DVD is nine D expeditions to DXCC. The 10 Most Wanted covers 10 of the rarest of the rare DX locations, and uh, there are more books being added all the time to DX Engineering's extensive collection of literature, including the ARRL textbooks from the annual contest University at Dayton. These are paperbacks. They're filled with printouts of all the uh, instructor slides. They're useful even if you weren't able to attend the lessons, especially if you weren't able to attend the lessons. If you want to become a better contester, there's no better guides available. Uh, topics include helpful tips and pointers, more specific contesting, uh, mode-specific rather contesting, electrical theory rules, ethics, propagation, station setups, and a lot more. And, of course, you got to look good, too. Apparels and collectibles section at DX Engineering has expanded. Uh, check out the new DX Engineering polo shirts. Oh, these are nice. I've got the T-shirts, and if the polo is anything like the T, it's going to be excellent. They're great for the next time your club uh, event calls for business casual. They're made from breathable material. They're comfy, whether you're wearing them inside a ham fest or outside on a hot field day. The new DX Engineering umbrella is great for keeping the sun from baking your gear and neck. The next time you're operating outdoors, and, well, you know, it works great for the rain, too. If you want to grab any of this stuff, good stuff, quality stuff from DX Engineering, whether it's the library of books and videos or apparel or collectibles or some coax or anything else, get your order in by 10 p.m. Eastern. Proven products, expert advice, the fastest shipping in the industry, that is DX Engineering. They are helping you shrink the globe. Request your catalog. Shop online 24-7 dxengineering.com slash ham nation dxengineering.com slash ham nation thank you dx engineering we do appreciate everything you do for ham nation and another person or or entity that dx engineering helps out a lot is last man standing and you know september 27th w5kub.com will be doing his webcast from the set of last man standing saturday the 27th he'll be on the set uh, interviewing a number of people uh, and showing everyone on the set, also the Papa System Group setting up that day to get ready for the special event. And then Sunday, September 28th, you can watch a lot of great interviews from the set. They'll move around to all of the six KH6 or K6H operating positions while the special event is going on. Uh, W5KUB.com, the webcast also will be giving out prizes to the viewers in the chat room. So you don't want to miss that. That is September 27th and 28th. Uh, the uh, K6H Last Man Standing special event on W5KUB.com. It's going to be amazing. But now, let's check out the news of the week with Amateur Radio Newsline. From Amateur Radio Newsline Report number 1,934, these are the Ham Nation headlines for Wednesday, September 10th, 2014. A news report out of Japan says the asteroid mission called Hayabusa 2, with a planned launch this December, will also carry an Amateur Radio satellite. Amateur Radio Newsline's Heather Emby, KB3TZD. 
Shin-in-2 will be among the first ham radio satellites going into orbit outside the influence of Earth's gravity. The relatively small bird will be put into an elliptic orbit around the Sun and travel to an orbit between Venus and Mars. Its inclination will be almost zero degrees, which means Shin-in-2 will stay in the Earth's equatorial plane. Its distance from the Sun will be between 0.7 and 1.3 astronomical units. An astronomical unit is 149,597,871 kilometers, which equals to about 92,955,807 miles. It was built in Japan by students at Kyushu Institute of Technology and carries a MoJ linear transponder for amateur radio communications along with CW and WSJT beacons. The satellite will operate on 437.505 MHz for its CW beacon and 437.385 MHz for the WSJT telemetry. The inverting CW and SSB transponders will uplink on 2 meters from 145.940 to 145.960 MHz using lower sideband. The downlink will use 435.280 to 435.260 MHz on upper sideband. All in all, a very ambitious project for ham radio in space. Another amateur radio satellite called ArtSat-2 Despatch will be carried into space on the same launch. The September 2014 issue of the free amateur television magazine CQDA-TV is now available for download. This month's issue contains articles on the Max 7456 OSD computer USB controller, the DATV Express project update, and the latest digital amateur television news. As always, the link to download your free copy can be found in the full edition of this week's amateur radio newsline report. It's time once again to get your kicks on Route 66, as the annual Route 66 on the air operation is now on through the 15th. This is the annual Route 66 on the air operation. It takes place from September 6th to the 15th. Route 66 is the famed 2,451-mile highway, opened back in 1926, connecting Chicago, Illinois, with Los Angeles, California. It was immortalized in the 1960s with the television show of the same name. With the introduction of the interstate highway system, Route 66 began its decline and was eventually replaced by the new superhighways. On June 27, 1985, the government decertified the highway and U.S. 66 ceased to exist. Now, in 2014, some 21 special event stations located in cities along the route will join together for the 15th annual Route 66 on the air. Operations are planned for all bands using all modes. The certificate will be available to those who work at least one of these stations. Complete information is available on the Citrus Belt Amateur Radio Club website at www.w6jbt.org. It's a lot of fun, and so far I've worked over half of the 21 stations, and my first Route 66 contact was W6R in Springfield, Missouri. Some guy named Bob Heil was on the other end. Hmm, name sounds familiar. If you missed the 2014 Dayton Hamvention Antenna Forum, I have some good news for you. Tim Duffy, K3LR, says that the 2014 Dayton Hamvention Antenna Forum slide presentation is available in PDF format and is now posted online at www.k3lr.com. To download and view them, simply click on the left side box marked Dayton Antenna Summary. In addition to the latest set, those going back as far as 2004 are also available. And finally, last year the Voyager 1 mission control team announced that the spacecraft had reached interstellar space, but many in the academic community remain skeptical. Now two researchers are looking to put any doubt to rest with a new test designed to show conclusively whether or not Voyager 1 has made it into interstellar space. Amateur Radio Newsline's Stephen Kenford, NAWB. According to the space reporter, the test will determine whether the spacecraft is inside or outside the heliosphere. That's a so-called bubble of solar particles and magnetic fields that the sun creates around itself. The researchers who developed the test believe that Voyager 1 will cross out of its current layer of the heliosphere within the next year or two. When that occurs, astrophysicists expect to see a reversal in the magnetic field around the spacecraft. The lack of a reversal should show that Voyager 1 is still inside the heliosphere. That said, other information already in the hands of researchers points to the fact that Voyager 1 has already left the heliosphere. After gathering data from a solar eruption that took particles around the probe, scientists determined that the density of the spacecraft's surroundings was much higher than the figures taken in earlier measurements when Voyager 1 had yet to cross into interstellar space. It currently takes radio signals from Voyager 1 over 17 hours to reach Earth. Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 were both launched in 1977. Their initial goal was to simply study the planets of our solar system. Now, a quarter of a century later, both probes are still operational. 
And that's all from the Amateur Radio Newsline, your independent source for amateur radio news brought to you each and every week for over 35 years and counting at www.arnewsline.org. I'm Don Wilbanks at E5DW73. We'll see you next time here on Ham Nation. Another good week for Amateur Radio Newsline, but now let's go down to uh, check out Bob and Mixers. Well, we talk a lot about audio and mixing things here and I, I get so many emails from everybody and we're going to start really getting into this and the first thing I want to do this week and going to be very short is we're going to teach you how to build a mixer no it's not some multi-channeled whatever it's a four channel line mixer now understand we're talking line level what I use this for is the output of the transceivers the receiver part to mix all of those into one powered speaker it works great it's line level in line out so it, it's not anything you're going to plug a microphone into this is line level but also if you have like a couple of different tape recorders or cd players and you want to put them into a one input this is your baby it's very simple very simple i have some uh, I have some slides, Victor, if you'll uh, run those by, let's do number one. You know, there, there's a good picture of, of the finished product. The second picture, when we bring that up, you will see the back of it. And it's, of course, one in and four out or four in and one out. It's, it goes either way. And the next picture will show you the inside of that. It's very simple. It's very simple. There's four potentiometers four resistors and four jacks the next picture shows you the other side of it and uh, you'll see the heat shrink uh, the, the, those yellow heat shrinks that's the uh, resistors and we we want those so uh, nothing gets shorted to ground or anything gets crazy if you're uh, adjusting one or the other it doesn't affect them and then the schematic and it's extremely simple that is it and uh, what what i had what I really encourage you to do if you if you've never built anything or if you've built a lot of things just do it go out and get the pieces and parts and coming back to me here is the parts it's this box and of course it's all down here all the parts that didn't fall on the floor <laughs> are in it you can go to Mauser uh, I like to buy my stuff from Gateway Electronics uh, Lisa's got all kinds of stuff. You can buy aluminum boxes like this, and then you get yourself the nice little jacks. She's got the quarter-inch panel jacks. You need four potentiometers, 10K. You want to get 10Ks, and then you need four resistors of 2.2K. And you saw the... Uh, uh, the diagram of that so that's real simple and uh, here is the parts list and I'm gonna hold this up and you can freeze frame this uh, later on from the replay and uh, there's your parts list and it's it's such a simple project but it's very usable I use this thing uh, this mixer by the way is right at uh, 35 to 38 years old and there's not a week goes by that I don't need this mixer and there's all the parts you need for it no I don't use it for microphones or we'll get into that later but this is a very simple project and and, and the reason I want to do some of these is I want to prove to you that you can do this if you've never soldered if you've never drilled a chassis now's the time to start because this is real simple stuff you're not going to uh, blow anything up or any of that kind of stuff and it's it's a very simple project and that's what we're trying to do here on ham nation is uh, we we have project as george takes you into some of the the great things that are out there uh, with the with the surface mount and all of that but we also have things that i don't want anybody to get scared and I have to tell you, this was one of the first products that Heil Sound built, believe it or not. And we sold a lot of them because back in the late 60s, actually this was 67, 68, this was a, a miracle box because you could plug things together and not worry about it. And you had level controls for each one of them. And there you could take your different receiver outputs, the speaker out of your receivers, 
plug them into here. That's the speaker out of the transceiver. And then the bottom one would be the final mix. And you just dial up which one you want. Then you take that output into a powered speaker like the JBL Control P. I talk about it a lot. It's just, it's just awful. It's terrible that everybody doesn't own one of those. It's just amazing because they're only about 150 bucks for a pair of them. They got two 35 watt amplifiers in them. And, and you want to get into that. And we'll get into that later. But I just wanted to pass this along. I want you to get involved in some of this. We're going to do some more as we get into these, these kind of sessions and uh, take some time here on Ham Nation to help you learn how to do some of this stuff. And you go from here, and then you could advance up to uh, smoke and cider with George. <laughs> and I really, really appreciate uh, the time to be able to do that here at night with you. So we want, uh, one, I, want, I want to tell you that Amanda uh, is not going to be here because she's on uh, 7230 right now uh, operating the W1AW uh, Slant Zero. She's, she's doing that, that station tonight. She had an appointment to do that at 9, and because we, uh, we were really late, she had to leave. But she, here's, the, here's the deal. Listen up. Listen up. She is transmitting on 7230, but they're going to listen up five at 7235. So those are going to be big pile ups. Well, then you'll get up there and transmit five up and so on. So there you go. And um, you want to make sure to, uh, to catch the guys on 20 meters. They're going to move up because of Route 66 uh, tonight. They're going to move up to 14296 is the word that I got from Steve. So that's what's going on here. Uh, George, you're still with us, I think. Yeah, I am, Bob, and I just checked in with yeah. Steve on 14296, so that's where he is. And, yeah, that mixer is a great little project to get started with. Very simple to build and useful, too. Yeah, I'm sure that all through your career you've built some things like that, and you think, well, boy, these are going to really be, uh, you know, they're going to just little be simple things. Well, I got to tell you, uh, Sometimes the simple things are the things you use the most, don't you think, George? I think so, and a simple thing it took to fix that, too. I know I ran into it, and I think we talked about it one time. You do need that resistor in there after that pot to make it all work out right. Yeah, yeah, if you short those together. And somebody asked in the chat room um, if, if it was audio or linear taper. You know what? That doesn't make a hill of bean difference. Uh, you you want to explain that, George? Yeah. So tell uh, them about the difference. If you had a choice, I would get audio taper, or you could use a logarithmic taper or a linear taper. And the differences are, we're going to talk about turning a pot, not the linear ones that go up and down, but turning a pot. If you turn from one end to the other on a linear taper, you've got a linear uh, change in your ohms all the way through. In other words, if it's a 10K ohm pot, middle waves would be 5K. However, our ears don't hear linearly. You know, they've, they've kind of got a logarithmic taper to it. So they make those pots so that most of the resistance change is in the beginning there of it. And as you go further, it has less change. So it, it makes a bigger change in, say, the first... Uh, half or so of the pod, and then the last half doesn't have as much effect on it. And you'll notice that on stereo receivers and such, but, you know, any of them will work. Yeah, that's true. And for this project, it's not a big deal. And uh, uh, hey, this is a good one. Uh, Tyler asked an in interesting question. Uh, uh, George, he wanted to know if a 1K would work as well as 2.2K. What, what would you say? I would say, yeah, but, you know, it's really going to depend on uh, on the impedance of what you're running into it. If you're running 8-ohm outputs from rigs into it, yeah, 1K one, one is going to work fine because all you're trying to do is build out those pots with that. So if you turn one of the pots all the way down, it doesn't short that mix bus to ground. And if, if you're 1K away but you're feeding it all with 8-ohm uh, inputs to it, then the 1K is going to be... Uh, not even noticed. 
Yeah, and uh, it, it, I like to use the 2.2. I've built several of them that's got 4.7K in them. And what they'll do is it's going to change where the pot goes, or where, what level you're going to have. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. It's a very simple project. Yo-Yo asks a really good question. Uh, uh, <laughs> Don, are you still here? I am, I yes. Don might have. No, I'm here. Uh, Yo-Yo wanted to know if we build a project like this, if the purple paint uh, had any effect. <laughs> yeah, it, it does. It makes it more highly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a better answer than I had. That was good. Uh, George, you, you have a yeah, you you have a comment on that, George? <laughs> um, yeah, I would say it it helps with the color of the sound a little bit. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah it, absolutely. It, make, it makes it makes it it, it makes your it makes your sound um, it makes it makes your audio highly desirable to listen to. H e i l y highly desirable. See what I did there? Yeah, that, exactly right. Exactly right. Uh, there was a really good question from Rich. He wanted to know if you do this. How would you keep the RF out of the control 2P? Well, I have to tell you that I have never been able to get RF into the control 2P because that is a, that is a speaker that they build for multi-million dollar radio studios and recording studios. And they've got that thing really uh, bootstrapped. So I don't think you'll have to worry about it. But you could, and this is something you might want to do, is to add uh, like a 001 capacitor across that each one of the jacks and across especially the output uh, jack. Uh, uh, you think that's, that'd be the way to do that, George? I think it would be. You could also add transformers in there, but then you get to running into quite a bit of money. And I would yeah. build it just like, like you showed it on the schematic, Bob, and just see if you've got an RF problem. If you don't, don't even put the capacitors in it. That's right. The, well, the thing is, is this line level. You're not going to have a, I don't see how, if you got RF problems at line level, you got yourself a problem. That's what I would say. <laughs> so uh, um, I, I think you'll be okay, and I think you're going to have fun with it. Well, we're going to... Uh, we're going to have to close up. We've ran really late tonight, and uh, we appreciate all of you sticking around, and it's so nice to have everybody here, and I, I appreciate uh, uh, the great uh, amount of video we get. My gracious, was that good or what? So we'll uh, find you all on the frequencies afterwards. Uh, we'll go up and find out what's going on with Amanda at 7230. Uh, I haven't heard a 40-meter frequency yet. Has anybody heard that, George? 7284, Bob. Yeah. Okay, where is it, uh, uh, Dale? Uh, 7284. Mike's on now. He came on about uh, five minutes ago. And they're going there for 100 go. check-ins tonight. Oh, all right. All right. <laughs> well, we'll make that happen. That'll be good. And uh, I think... Um, uh, Cheryl and some of them are down on 3847. So we'll have a good spread across the band tonight. That covered up with uh, <laughs> a Route 66. It should be a real fun night on ham radio tonight, I'll tell you. And Andy, yeah, purple's always worth a decibel. <laughs> well, thanks a lot, everybody. Uh, we will see you back here next week. And uh, boy, uh, things are growing uh, coming up to the uh, all of the events going on and the uh, the different conventions, and then uh, we're going to go out and spend time with uh, uh, the the whole team at Last Man Standing. Uh, just stay tuned here every Wednesday. You never know what's going to happen. So uh, we'll catch you on the band somewhere, a little high, a little low, but uh, thanks for being here, and we'll see you next week right here on Ham Nation. This is Bob Heil, K9EID from the Ozarks, and 7-3 everybody. Bye-bye for now.